um, someone came to me and said, you're an architect, aren't you? So I said, yeah. <laughs> um, and they said, well, congratulations. We've just bought a cruise ship, and we want you to fly out there. The, this cruise ship is moored in the island of Curacao out in the Caribbean. We want you to fly to the ship and look at it, you know, because um, we want to completely remodel. We're going to spend millions on this ship because this ship is going to be for delivering new OTA, which is like the highest level that hasn't even been released yet. Now this and is an operating Thetan level. Yeah, and they said this level can only be done, Hubbard has written, this level is so powerful, so amazing, that it can, and it's so confidential, it can't even be done on land. It can't even be done on land. It has, Hubbard wrote, it has to be done on a ship in the middle of the ocean so that nothing can upset it, you know, away from all the interbulation of like society. Interbulation. Interbulation meaning, you know, even though you might have an organization in a city, you know, there's traffic, there are cops, there are things that upset, you know, society impacts it, you know. But OT8 is so um, delicate, nothing can be in distraction, so it has to be done in the middle of the ocean on a ship. Now at this point, how, f how much auditing had you had by now? Um, I had pretty much all I had was what I had in London. Um, so you weren't uh, up to these OT levels. Oh no, no, nowhere, nowhere, not even close. So no. you still had uh, the idea. Did you still have the same idea that you had started with that there were these wonderful powers that people could attain? Oh yes, I, I mean I would look at the people at the the, the sandcastle who were doing like OT six and seven. That's where. Uh, People, Scientologists come and stay and right. fly. Right, and, uh, and I would even interview them to see if they, everything was okay, you know. That was my job. And I was like, oh my God, these people are so cool. And if only I knew what they knew. If only I was doing what they were doing. And they seem so kind of calm and, you know, um, they seem, nothing would upset them, you know. They were like, they seem such calm. I had so much admiration for them. I thought, it, and I thought, I just can't wait. Mm to get to these levels, you know, and these people are so, and you know, out in the world they were like chiropractors and, you know, and they had businesses and they, they just seemed so effect, they seemed different from other people. So I still had the whole thing up on a plateau, you know, uh, where it, this all will be worthwhile because we're making these people who are going to solve all of society's problems. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought, I was kind of reinvigorated. I thought, wow, this is such an important ship, you know. And OT8 is so important because it's going to solve all the world's problems, you know. Um, I really thought once OT8 start being made, um, the problems the world has with war and communism and poverty, I thought this would all vanish, you know. I can't even begin to think. I, can't, I don't even want to go now. It's difficult for me to go to where my mind was at. Uh, I, I kind of shut it off. I think, did I really think that? I, I can't even go. I, you know, it's like walking down a long, dark corridor, and then you walk down it, and you think, did I, re I really believe that stuff? Yes, I did at the time. I believed it. But I don't even, even now, I don't want to go there. I don't want to admit to you that I believe these people could do all that. It's like looking, it's like, looking at a different person. Yeah, exactly. And, and now I know what I know about the true nature of the OT levels. And I'm like, this is what it is, and this is where I had it. I can't even go to where I thought it was so wonderful. Because then I start to think, you're an idiot, you're a moron. Like, Do you have a brain? <laughs> I can't believe that I was so gullible. I, I can't, it's difficult, you know. So anyway, um, I said, yeah, oh, if I can help with that ship, that is the coolest thing. So I flew to the ship, I looked at it, and then, um, you know, it, it was like um, a huge cruise ship. It was like a 13,000 ton cruise ship, um, 400 foot long, 450 feet long, um, moored on, in secret on this island. In, so I would fly to Miami, and then we would take like a secret flight to Curacao. We arrived in the middle of the night, and we were like driven kind of undercover to this cruise ship. And Why I can't. Why was it in such secrecy? Because they told me that, you know, if ever they dared to bring this ship into United States waters, um, 
it, it would uh, be immediately confiscated against taxes, and, and you know the, the, the United States authorities would seize it as, as church assets against back taxes. Or but why or were they telling you something like that? Because the, I think they wanted to explain to me the shroud of secrecy. You know, I, I signed what's called a bond, which means I would immediately give them ten thousand dollars if I revealed the location of the ship. So I'm going, well, come on, guys. You know, but I mean, why why would they? Why would they feel uh, safe about telling you that there were back taxes? Why would they I tell you something like that? I don't that? know. I guess they had to come up with some kind of thing for the secrecy that would be satis would satisfy me. But what yeah. I'm saying is, why would they think you would keep that secret for them? Well, because I'd signed a bond. You know, anything, any information that I released about the ship, I would immediately have to pay ten thousand dollars. You know, the location, why it was there. You know anything? If I revealed any confidential information about it, did it ever occur to you that the authorities in the United States should know that this no, ship was sitting there? I would never have dreamed of that. You know, because you're now protecting Scientology at all costs. Right, right. You know, so like all through the immigration and leaving the United States and coming back in, we weren't to mention it. You know, we were going to Curacao as tourists. You know, we weren't to mention the free winds. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, the night I arrived, like late at night, and in, in a veil of secrecy, I mean, I thought I was James Bond. Bond, James Bond, you know, like on a mission. It was so cool, you know. And, and then you see this huge ship there, and you go, oh, my God, the church is so powerful. They have this huge ship they just go out and buy. And, like, they are, so, they are just unbelievable. What They can do anything, you mm. know. They, and this is the ship that is going to save the world, and here I am. Arriving at this ship, you know, oh my God, I was just, it was so cool, you know, and... Uh, incredible. Incredible, yeah, and, uh, and so, uh, um, anyway, I sleep that night in a cabin, the next day, um, I'm with this guy called Steve Kazaki, who's like, the, he's in charge of all the renos on the ship, so I meet him. Renovations. Oh, renovations, I, I, or I think actually I flew out with him. Um, and he says, well, you know, so they have all these sketches by interior designers, like little sketches on bits of paper. And these are like sacred sketches prepared by like the LRH architect. They have a guy called Barry Stein mm. and his girlfriend, whose name I have Carol, someone or other. And they are the LRH architect and the LRH assistant architect. I find out they're not actually licensed architects. Therefore, right. it's not legal for them to call themselves architects, but you know, Whatever. But hey. The hell is like so. Anyway, um, so they show me all these sketches and say, you know, this is the ship now. The ship is just like squalid. It's called La Boheme or something, and um, it's just like ugly. You know, like brown carpet, blue chairs, green curtains, and it's obviously. It looks like it hasn't seen a lick of paint in fifty years. It's just like. The cabins are just ugly, you know. It's just like, it's like, you know, what kind of people would go cruising on a ship like this? It's like just horrible, you know. If you compare it to like the QE2 or like, you know, a cruise ship in Miami, like Carnival Cruise Lines, it's just a joke. Inside, it's just so squalid. But they have all these sketches of all these beautiful rooms, of, you know, beautiful restaurants. And, uh, you know, they have like, um, the restaurant is on like the lower level deck and it overlooks all the winches and the anchor and it's just ugly, you know. And they say, this is going to be the new OT8 course room, but we're going to take the restaurant up three decks to, um, you know, so it has a great view out to sea. And I go, well, there's a little problem, you know, the galley is down here where the old restaurant was. And the new restaurant is going to be up with the view, but hey, where's the kitchen, guys? <laughs> and they go, yeah, good point. Um, <laughs> okay, we'll put in like an elevator to take all the food up. So I'm going, well, you know, um, a big restaurant, you know, because I've worked on restaurants in England, you know. I say, well, uh, you know, the way you plan in architecture, you have the, the dining room, you have the kitchen, and you, you know, there's constant traffic in and out, in and out. You don't send the food up in elevators, <laughs> flying off the elevator. Come on, guys. <laughs> like, why don't you keep the restaurant down here? 
and you know, so I'm like being creative with it. I'm like being an architect. I'm saying, okay, guys, come on, keep the restaurant down here next to the kitchen. You, there's no space up there for the kitchen. You know, keep you know, function because I'm going back to my architecture. I'm back being an architect. Come on, guys, let me tell you how it's done here. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a ship, but hey, it's like a building. Yeah. And I go, the course room can be anywhere. Who cares about the course room? You know, let's put the course room up there. And they go, hey, you don't understand. Let me explain to you the way it is. These drawings are all approved, these sketches are approved by the upper management, by David Miscavige himself. You we know. aren't going to change them now. These drawings are cast in stone. You don't come on here, you know, and be an architect and start telling us how to do this. We are telling you, this is how it's going to be done. You just have to figure it out. You don't come in here being creative like throwing in your little ideas of like how it should function and offering little hints, you know, that is not what we want. You need to work out how to get these sketches reality. So I'm like, okay, whatever. Like, you know, I'm not used to working like this as an architect. I'm used to like, I'm respected, you know. I go into, I would in England, I would go into meetings with like, I work for Gillette and I would see the boss of Gillette and he would say, Okay, Lawrence, you know, we want to do a factory. How can we make this function? Well, I go, okay, well, the trucks arrive here, you unload here, um, you know, we'll do the, the injection molding here. This was with the boss of Gillette UK. I'd be like working with him and I would be respected. And he'd say, you're the architect, I, this is what we want, you know, we'll pay you thousands for this, you know, and it's a cool job. I loved it. Yeah. Now I'm on this ship and I'm, you know, saying, okay, guys, you need to rethink this. Uh, this isn't functioning, you know. And almost on every level, you know, they had like, um, I go, you know, you can't have a course room next to a kitchen, you know, the noise from the kitchen will disturb the course room. You can't have a restaurant not next to a kitchen, you can't get the food to the restaurant, guys. Um, you know, like, um, you can't have offices. Uh, you know, next to cabins, you know, I'm like taught all about function and planning and these people have no idea. Right. But they won't listen to me, you know. I'm just like a low, you know, I'm like not even an officer in the Sea Org and like, you know, these people are like lieutenants and captains in the Sea Org. So even though they know nothing about architecture, nothing about design, I, I'm like nobody to them, except, oh, but you do have this one use, you can draw plans. Mm -hmm. you, so you have this little use, but you just do your little thing and don't bother us. Mm -hmm. But we need you. So mm -hmm. I'm like, I've never experienced anything like this. Um, and anyway, and then it's not bef long before long, the, 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 the guy Renault's I see is like a kind of a cabinet guy. We're in a cabin. Now and the Renault's I see means renovations in He's charge. in charge of the renovation project. Uh -huh. And I'm not used to having people be in charge of me as an architect. You know, I'm, I'm the architect. I'm in charge of construction. Right. I tell contractors what to do. He's telling me what to do. I don't like it, but whatever. I'm, you have to, you know. So anyway, he says, let's find out what these walls are made of in a cabin. So he grabs a hammer and he pounds it. He smashes into this wall. I see this blue powdery substance. Particles fly. I go, Steve, stop, you know. I'm pretty damn sure that's asbestos. And, uh, and I'm like, uh-oh, because I've learned all about asbestos in architecture school. And I go, uh-oh, you're releasing it, let's do something, let's seal it up, let's get the hell out of here. Like, I'm freaking, uh, the panic mode, because I've been in factories in England with asbestos. If they find asbestos, they freak out. Uh, the whole Why? thing's closed down because, as okay, one little particle of asbestos is microscopically like a little fishing hook mm -hmm. and it's we were releasing probably millions of these particles and then one little particle you breathe it in it hooks into the lining of your lung and then there's no way the lung can't flush it out it's hooked in with a little barbed hook the lung can't flush it out with mucus or anything and there it's there and then as i understood it medical research said one little particle 20 years later you've got lung cancer one particle and we've just it's released, a carcinogen. It's a carcinogen, yeah. Like, you know, they used to use it all the time because it's a great insulator, it's a great material, mm -hmm. it's, you know, but then they replaced that. They never used asbestos in England anymore since the 70s. 
because it's one of the deadliest materials known to man. It's like, and um, so yeah. what do you do and if you find if you have a building or a ship with asbestos? It, it's either that building is is immediately sealed off with plastic sheets with airlocks, and then the as you know they're called in a special asbestos abatement company, licensed and totally specialist, and they would wear spacesuits, you know, with respirators and air tanks, and they would remove every last particle of it, dispose of it in proper bags, and then it would go to a special hazardous materials dump. And then, you know, they, the, then the building would be certified asbestos free, and then we could, you know, then you'd have to use new insulation materials, asbestos free, and unbelievably expensive, unbelievably expensive. But then, you know, no company wants to own a building that is full of asbestos that, you know, um, people can sue them and, you know. What about a ship? What do you do about a ship? You know, I didn't know at that point what, what would you do. Um, and so then I'm walking around the ship and I go into the engine room and I see panels missing from like the control room, a panel missing and I see a big chunk of blue asbestos hanging down. What I identify as blue asbestos now in, in my lectures in England, they told us that there's an even more, the deadliest form of asbestos is called blue asbestos. And, you know, I don't know if I'm being exactly technical correct or if the terms are the same in America, but I believe they colored it blue, especially to show that it was hazardous. You know, it's not blue, it's painted, it's dyed blue. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, if white asbestos microscopically one hook, it's like one little fishing hook, blue asbestos is like, a barbed ball of like hundreds of hooks, one particle, you know, so if the one hook gets into your lungs and it doesn't hook on, the barb has hooks in all directions and it's going to hook on. So that's like so the most even more deadly. Dangerous. It's even more dangerous. So I'm like, okay, so I said, I, I will find the chief engineer on the ship who's a guy called Wack Alcock. I think he was from New Zealand. And he will, he will know. So I go to him and I say, sir, you have asbestos in your engine room just hanging there. And he says, it's not asbestos. I'm the engineer. It is not asbestos. What did he say it was? I said, well, yeah. So he said, it's just insulation. So, okay, I can't believe this. So, and I'm like beginning to question my own education. It, you know, I'm pretty damn sure. You know, I've been to lectures on it and they've shown it to us in class. Like, so were there any plans for this shift? Yeah, I then went you know, into his office and I found a full set of blueprints. You know, the ship had been built in Finland, I think in 1968, and they're a full set of blueprints. I pull them out. I think, blueprints, at last I know what I'm doing. And then, but it's all in Finnish, you know, whatever language, I believe Finnish. But then asbestos is the same. So then asbestos, like all You're of the- You're seeing this written I on see the, the word asbestos, like, you know, they've got a section through the ship showing all the walls and they're saying asbestos with an arrow. So it's on every, the underside of every so deck. So it is asbestos. It is asbestos. It's blue asbestos, blue asbestos in the ship. Everywhere. Sprayed on when the ship was in the shipyard, they built the steel, they built the hull, and then they just spray it. You now, know. now, isn't asbestos uh, so deadly that, I mean, it's actually illegal to have mm -hmm. any asbestos at all in a yeah. structure where people are going to be? Right. It, it, exactly so, yeah. And it's... Back in England, they made it like a criminal offence to knowingly have asbestos, you know, particles released into the air. I mean, if you do it by accident, then, you know. But as soon as you know, knowingly release it or don't do anything about it, you can, it's, it's a prison term, a huge fine. Well, and these and, people and knew they had Also the in California, in the whole of the United States, it's the same. Very, very serious, you know. So I've been schooled in this, you know. You see asbestos, you like scream and get it handled, yeah, you know. Yeah, and get out of there. And get out of there, yeah. And uh, so anyway, I was just like, I was running around going, asbestos, asbestos, everyone run. And they're going, wow. <gasps> Can't believe wow. it. And they won't listen to me. So this chief engineer, Wack Alcock, mm -hmm. said it's not asbestos? He, he said it is not asbestos. He said, I'm the chief engineer, blah, blah, blah. I knew it was, you know. I had no question in my mind, and then I saw the blueprints. So then about this time, a lady called Biddy Miscavige, who was like... Uh, now, Biddy Miscavige is uh, she, married to David Miscavige's brother, Ronnie, right, isn't and she? And she was like, I think, Commander Biddy Miscavige. 
She's and a Commodore's messenger. Yeah, she was in the like CMO. In the CMO organization. And she was, you know, with a fancy uniform. Mm -hmm. She was in overall, overall charge of everything to do with the ship, over the captain, over everything. So she arrived at the ship. Mm -hmm. So I go up to her and say, Sir, you know, I think you have a problem with this ship, you know. I mean, I, and, and like people, she's like looking at me like, you're telling me I have a problem? Because that isn't the way in the SEALG. You don't walk up to a high-ranking SEALG officer and say, you have a problem. <laughs> you say, um, there was a problem, but I have solved it. <laughs> you really <laughs> right. can't walk up to someone and say, you have a problem. But that wasn't the way I was used to operating. Right. I would just, you know, hey, if the, if the boss of Gillette UK has a problem, I'll say, call him out and say, you have a problem. Right. <laughs> and you say, hey, thanks for telling me. Right. Because, you know, I don't want there to be a problem running out of control. I want to know. Right. And she's like, you're telling me I have a problem? Who are you? And I'm going, well, I'm an architect from England. She didn't even know who I was. I'm an architect from England, and I want you to look at these blueprints. And she says, oh, she said, you know, she said, doesn't asbestos cause cancer? And I'm going, finally, finally, I've got through to someone. You know, finally, they're going to like look, address this problem. Yeah. Because I'm, and I'm and saying, get everybody off this yeah, ship. Yeah, get everyone off the ship. And then, you know, to me, it's over. You know, like, they've got a big problem. Yeah. I, I'm thinking, it's over. And finally, I brought it to attention of Biddy Miscavige. And finally, this is a person sufficiently senior to like do something about it. And then, so we ha she says, we'll have a meeting, we'll get the bring these blueprints, Steve Kosaki, the chief engineer, the captain, we're all sitting around the table. And she actually is pretty sympathetic, she's a little freaked out. She is like, oh my, she's like, what are we going to do, guys, what are we going to do? And so Steve Kosaki and the chief engineer say, well, you know, we've studied the LRH advices and policies on the ship, he was a captain in the US Navy, LRH, um, you know, new ships, he knew everything about ships, and, and we exactly implement all of his policies and all of his advices. He hasn't said anything about asbestos being a problem, and obviously asbestos was a problem back on those ships. And then, um, but he did mention fiberglass as like being like, fiberglass is like long needles microscopically, and it can irritate you, and you can breathe it in and it's nasty. So, sir, Mr. Miscavige, sir, we have ripped all of the fiberglass out of the ship, and sure enough, there's a big pile of fiberglass on the dock. And I'm going, well, excuse me, you know, <laughs> excuse me? And fiberglass isn't hazardous. Uh, you know, fiberglass is commonly used as insulation in, in uh, buildings, and it, no one says it's a problem. And I said, if you rip it all out of the decks, you know, and you're out in the hot Caribbean sun, the sun's going to come beating straight through the steel walls and deck. Maybe you should put it all back. And they're like, with me, like, this guy is like, got a couple of screws loose. Uh, okay, they say, you know. They're looking at you like you have screws loose. I'm, I'm like a nutcase. They're going, you know, and I'm, they say, you just don't know Scientology. You just don't know what you're talking about. You know, What's Hubbard says, got? Hubbard has said fiberglass is the problem. He said nothing about asbestos. So we've taken all the fiberglass out. So I said, you know. You've like, uh, I don't even know what I said, you've like removed the few mice walking around the ship, but you left the dragon, you know, running around breathing fire. And they're going, oh, they're just like exasperated with me. And uh, I said, look, I said, Hubbard wrote his policies. I said, he probably wasn't even aware of medical research into asbestos. And they're going, Hubbard wasn't aware? What are you saying? Like, <laughs> Impossible. Impossible. You know, like, they said, no, Hubbard, the chief engineer and this guy, Kazaki, say, if Hubbard didn't say asbestos was a problem, it is not a problem. Besides, Hubbard, you know, Hubbard, Hubbard knew all about cancer, and he said cancer was caused by sexual misconduct not asbestos, and that's what we follow. So Biddy Miscavige is like, phew, guys, what a relief. I thought we were going to have a problem, but it's all cool. And she turns to me and says, Lawrence, do you now understand the way it is? You know, 
and like my mind is reeling because on the one hand there's like my education. And did they also, uh, were they also uh, feeling that because they were Scientologists it wasn't going to Right, there's the thought, the thought that, you know, you don't understand the people coming to this ship are going to be on the highest level of, um, you know, they're going to be OTAs. You could probably hit them on the head with a hammer and it wouldn't hurt them. You know, they are like so above the physical universe. And this is so theta that like these people are practically invincible, you know. So that the asbestos won't bother won't be them problem, anyway. Won't be a problem. But what about all the crew members of this ship? You know, I never even, to that day, I never even thought about that. They're not, I never thought about that. Good point. <laughs> well, they were the ones with long-term exposure, too. Mm -hmm. So what happened? Okay, so after that meeting, asbestos was no longer a problem. And then they started the renovation work. They ripped into the ship, you know. Like I said, they were moving restaurants to different decks, putting in elevators, um, just ripped it was just ripped apart and then you know like there was all new electrical so every time that was attached to the underside of deck so you know you can't it would have to be supported by brackets so every time you did that you would screw into the asbestos through the asbestos into the steel they put in all new air conditioning so every time you put in a new duct you know, you rip out the asbestos. So this is just asbestos flying everywhere in the ship now? Uh, yeah, it was all new plumbing. The old plumbing, they used like salt water to flush the toilets on the ship, which was kind of gross. So all the pipes are corroded. It was just dripping everywhere. This ship was squalid. And it was so asbestos, they would just scrape it away, you know, with no mask, no nothing. Just it would, people would be covered in blue. Oh my God. Just people be just covered in blue asbestos. And one guy even, I said to him, asbestos, asbestos, and he even pitted it up. I said, it's not a problem, he pitted it up and bit it. No. And they're just, you know, anyway, I don't know, I put it out of my mind. These people know. are all now terribly They think they're protected cancer. by the policies of L. Ron Hubbard, and they're invincible. So then anyway... Um, Including you. You're now at risk I was as never well. happy with it. I just shut up like I had on so many other things, you know. Um, so then anyway, they fell behind with the work. It was falling behind schedule that they wanted to release OTA. So they hired a ship fitting company out of England, Southampton, England, who worked mostly in Miami on refitting cruise ships. So then, you know, they had a contract with these people. They all flew out to the ship. They were all non-Scientologists, you know, it's a WOG ship refit company. And then, you know, I'd drawn up the plans by then. So they arrived on the ship. They flipped. They saw asbestos everywhere. And it was what, it was like a major public relations problem for the ship. And, and they couldn't just fob off these guys and say, well, Aaron Ron Hubbard says. <laughs> because it, you know, they're used to ships. They knew what they were talking about. Well, I mean, when these people came and it voiced the same concerns that you had voiced, mm -hmm. did Biddy Miscavige or Wack Alcock or any of these people then say, come to you and say, maybe you're right. No, 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 no. They never said that. But they, at the same time, they had to address it because, you know, they didn't want like a big public relations flat with this like non Scientology company possibly reporting them, being threatening to just immediately pull off the project, which they did. You know, they threatened to immediately pull off. And so they. You know, I, I mean, I, I think this company, by rights, they should have just pulled off because they had the yeah. health of their guys to consider. And their, I know their workmen were freaked because they knew all about asbestos. So anyway, they finally negotiated and negotiated and they worked out a handling. They came up with like, any time asbestos was uncovered on the ship, they wouldn't just hack into it. They would had a little crew they made up of about four guys wearing like, you know. Four guys from this company? No, four guys who were SEAL members. Oh, four members. Scientologists. And they would like wrap themselves in sheets and they would put like, you know, disposable masks on you use for like, but so you don't breathe But that doesn't protect you from no, asbestos. No, no, And they would, they were armed with spray bottles of water and paint, spray paint. And so they would run over to the asbestos problem where it had been exposed and spray it. But that doesn't resolve it, does it? No, but, 
you see it's better because the fiberglass is really, I mean, asbestos is really dangerous when it's dry and flaking and airborne, it goes airborne, the particles. So, but now if it's wet, if it's in a bucket of water, you know, it, it can't become airborne. Or if you spray the wall. If you spray the it wall, will temporarily, it temporarily is wet. Temporarily. You wet it down and, um, and then if you spray paint it. And this company was willing to subject its people to that kind of danger? Well, you know, they'd signed a contract probably worth four or five hundred thousand. But those They're people... They're committed to it. But those people uh, are now at grave risk. Yes. From exposure to asbestos. Yes. Do you remember the name of that company? I believe it was called, it was based in Southampton. I believe it was called like CCL or something. I can find it out. CCL. They should be alerted. Yes. Yeah. Well, they knew. They knew. Um, so I don't know. They had like rather secretive negotiations with them. I don't know if they offered them more money. I don't know how they, because when they came to the ship, they were outraged. And then they were going to pull off, and then they agreed to to work on the ship. Um, but you know, under the conditions that if you know when the asbestos was found, these guys would run over and spray it and wet it. So they finished their project. No, I wouldn't say. I would say that things went badly with them, and um, no, they, you know, the ship. Their workers were extremely unhappy. I mean, I, I remember they would sleep in the cabins wearing these m dust masks, you know. And, and I remember talking to the workers, and they're going, they, they were English, you know, I was English, they were English, and we were kind of friends, and they were befuddled, you know, like they were worried about their health, they were worried about our health. They, they were like, if this is Scientology, what are you people doing? And they were like, we want out of here. They were so unhappy, yeah. so unhappy. And they were like, we've got wives and kids, you know. Um, so I would say they just stayed a few weeks and then things fell apart, you mm -hmm. know. They, they were arguments about the work, the materials weren't arriving on time. There were a number of factors, but they left. Mm -hmm. They left in October uh, and this 1987. Is, uh, 1987. Yeah, and the ship was, so far from complete, it wasn't, you know, they did hardly any work, really. It was so far from complete. So then the people running the ship had this bright idea, let us recruit from Los Angeles, from Clearwater, from anywhere in the United States, Scientology carpenters, metal workers, plumbers, electricians. Let us have our own work crew of, like, not SEAL members, but public Scientologists, anyone who's to do with contracting, let us bring these people on the ship. We'll pay, the, you know, they'll get full room and board and stay in the cabins. Um, and then they will be paid like $800 a week tax free, you know, because it's in the Caribbean. And they will work and finish the ship. And then they were controllable because they were Scientologists. You know, they couldn't, they had ways to control them. You know, they, they, like, they, they are not allowed to sue the church. There is no legal recourse if you're a Scientologist unless you get, agree to be kicked out of the church. Did any of these people ever voice an objection to being subjected to asbestos? No, they didn't seem remotely worried about it. I mean, some of them, I Were don't they know. told? Were they aware of it? No one pointed it out to them, for sure. No one said, look, this is asbestos, guys. Time to freak out. Uh, but some of them, as they were, worked in construction, I can't imagine, didn't know. Did you ever tell anybody? I don't think I ever told, I don't think I discussed it with them. Uh, do you remember any of the names of these people? Yes, yes, yeah, I do. I mean, I could w reconstruct a list. They should be warned. They should be warned, yeah. They should be, and there were maybe a hundred of them. Um, so anyway, they then got to work and the sh ship was just finished up. And then, you know, all the new furnishes arrived, new carpet, all the stuff arrived, air freighted from Miami, brought on the island. And then all the paneling was put back. But, you know, the sh for example, the decks would have like long corridors. And then, you know, 
you'd have the steel deck and then you'd have the layer of asbestos and all the pipes running in that and then you'd have like a full ceiling with more asbestos tiles in like a metal, supported in a metal grid and that would be the finish that you'd see. But this wasn't airtight, you know, there'd be like channels and the ceiling would sit in it. It's not airtight, so all the asbestos flaking and falling apart was out of sight, but you know, it would be leaking through these panels. And then a ship at sea, you know, I mean, I went to sea in that ship, it shuddered, it shook, it vibrated, you know. Ships, it's like an aircraft, it shakes, it rattles. So all of that asbestos that has been tampered with is loose, shaking to this day. You know, and then of course on a ship they're always doing repair work, so they take the panels down, you know, fix the pipe, put the panel back. This is just uh, horrible. It's horrible, it's a nightmare. So everybody who goes onto the free winds to do OT8 is at deadly risk mm -hmm. of cancer from asbestos. Yes. How, how is it that, uh, that no uh, health inspectors have discovered this or uh, have they, have they, have the, has the ship never come back into U.S. waters? No, the ship never ever comes into U.S. waters. It, it sails to a few islands in the Caribbean. I believe it's been up to Ensenada, Mexico. But um, you know, uh, David Miscavige and senior management, someone someone in management or one of their attorneys must be aware of this asbestos danger. Well, yes, they would. Um, I mean, I was on the ship when Miscavige and all those people would come to it. You know, they would come to it before the renovations were complete, and they would come in the company of Biddy Miscavige, and so you know they could see the whole thing ripped apart. Um, so whether Biddy chose to tell them or she must have reported this. Yes, I would say so. So they all know. I would say they definitely do know. Yes. Um, and it horrifies me to think of, of hundreds of public who go on vacation and go to do courses who are being subjected to this risk without their permission, you know, without, like, if, if I said to you, Stacy, let's go visit Chernobyl, yeah. you'd say, wait a minute, that's a nuclear power station that exploded and is, like, contaminated for the next thousand years. I choose not to go there. Right. But people would, and as, as far as I'm concerned, asbestos is as dangerous as radioactive contamination. Maybe even worse. But like, and if they said to someone, hey, come and cruise on this ship, you know, you are going to be exposed to contamination that can cause you cancer. Do you still want to come? <laughs> it's a no-brainer. But of course people don't know. You know, it's just horrible. would you come with your asbestos testing equipment, meters, and laboratories? No. How would a person uh, know if they've been endangered, if this asbestos is in their lungs? Uh, well, I believe that, um, I believe, I'm not sure medically, you know, I'm not trained in medicine, but I believe you can have a particular type of x-ray on which these particles would show up. And so I would suggest, you know, I'm still worried about it to this day because I was on the ship for a year in the worst periods and I still, you know, go on the internet and read about the hazards of asbestos and I think, well, should I go for an x-ray? And then I have, I have nightmares of dying of the horror, how horrible it must be to die of lung cancer. And I know, for example, that if you smoke, um, I've read that, you know, if you're exposed to asbestos, don't smoke because that can make it even worse. So mm -hmm. I never smoke and I av avoid any other kind of lung contamination. But of course I live in LA with smog, you know. Um, but now I'm thinking, uh, you know, I should, um, part of me doesn't want to know. I don't want to know how much asbestos do I have in my lungs? I, I, you know, because I have two daughters and a granddaughter. I don't want to die in 10 years of lung cancer. I don't. Part of me, I don't even want to know. But part of me now says, I should go and have it checked, you know, because maybe they can be removed or flushed out or maybe, you know, I do, I take antioxidants and I, and I take vitamin E and I take, you know, but I, I mean, I know that like antioxidants help you with free radicals in food. Do they, can they do anything about little microscopic hooks in your lungs? You know, and if I feel short of breath or something, I think, uh-oh, is it my time? You know, it's like, 
I live with it, mm -hmm. and then all those other people there live with it. You know, they don't even know. You know, so I'm thinking now when I go back to LA, I will get tested. You know, maybe they have advanced technology body testing. I don't know. I think you should. I would like to know.